You ever taken one of those online quizzes to find out, you know, which Harry Potter character are you or which cast member of the office would you be? Those types of things. You know, we can kind of do the same thing with uh, leadership. What kind of a leader are you? And there's some online quizzes and things, but but really it's more just of a self-examination thing. And thing. What kind of a leader are you? What kind of leader do you want to be? Those are the kinds of questions we ask when we get into things about leadership styles and discovering, you know, what's our particular leadership style and what's the leadership style needed for the group that, that we're leading. So let's take a look at some of the different kinds of leadership styles uh, that we that we that we have that we've um, that we recognize here. So first of all, you have what we call an authoritarian leader, which is somebody that says, I am in charge. They're clearly in charge. And, and sometimes this is necessary. The authoritarian Leadership kind of has a, a bad rap, but uh, a bad rep. But really, sometimes it's necessary. But not always, but sometimes it could be necessary. But an authoritarian leader says, "I'm in charge." So authoritarian leadership um, basically is a, a traditional top-down hierarchy where somebody's in charge at the top, and everybody else kind of falls in somewhere below them in the in the structural uh, hierarchy of the of the system. There, uh, one person is defining the objectives and issuing the marching orders, telling everybody what to do and and where we're headed. Um, this is really kind of an efficient leadership style when it comes to time. Uh, so if, if you if you are under a very strict deadline and you need something done, very, you got to get something done very quickly, then an authoritarian leadership style can be very effective uh, because it's quick in, in making decisions. It provides very clear guardrails. Uh, people know what they're doing and when they're doing it and, and uh, those types of things. It, it provides those very clear uh, guidelines and guardrails for people. So there are advantages. In fact, let's take a look at some of the um, different pros and cons of a authoritarian leadership and we'll do this with all the different styles but uh, so some of the, the positives for authoritarian leadership are that it's efficient decision making because you have one person making the decision so it's it's a very top down very efficient decision making um, it's a very defined chain of command there's no question about who reports to whom who's in charge and what the what the uh, the uh, chain of command is there so it's very clear in that regard your task assignments are very clear and it also creates very consistent results we'd get the same thing kind of over time because you you have the same people doing the same things and and you get that repetition and that efficiency in that so you get very clear and consistent results right the the negatives the potential negatives with an authoritarian leadership system or style uh, are that followers may resist or revolt May, may not be interested in being led like that. It does stifle creativity and innovation. It does not in, invite people to be creative and come up with different ways to do things. We want you to do the same thing the same way every time. It limits group input, doesn't provide a lot of opportunity for people to speak up and to have buy in there. And so you're probably going to get more turnover as a result. Uh, people kind of chafe at that after a while. People, people aren't comfortable with that. A lot of people aren't. So you're going to probably see higher turnover with an authoritarian leadership style than you will um, other types of leadership styles. So, so again, positives, negatives, you got to weigh that out against what your goals are and what's necessary for that situation. But, um, but there you have authoritarian leadership. Another style of leadership that we could look at is called participative leadership, participative or participative leadership, which basically says, I want to hear from you. The leader is saying, I want, I want to hear from you. Let's get everybody involved. Um, let's have a group discussion, those types of things. So in participative, participative leadership, um, it's semi-democratic. So you still have a leader making the decisions, but really they're saying, I want input. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's bounce ideas around. Uh, now, in the end, the leader typically has the final say, um, but they are also intentional about including others. So that's why we say it's semi-democratic. You're getting you're getting some input, you're getting some say, but in the end, the leadership is going to have the final say. Uh, and, but this can be engaging and motivating for a team to even hear, feel like they are heard, to have their voices heard can be engaging and, and can motivate people on that team. However, it can also be potentially time consuming because you're taking the time to involve everybody and, uh, and get everybody's input and have, let everybody have a say. It takes more time. So it can be very time consuming to do that. So positives and negatives about participative leadership. Um, you have on the plus side, you have higher team motivation and satisfaction. People are, are more involved. They're engaged. They're, they're more satisfied with that, that team experience usually. It encourages creativity. It encourages people to be creative and be innovative in the way that they do things. It can increase team cohesion because you're getting to know everybody. You're getting everybody having a say in what's going on. And, and so that's good. And you get that diversity of viewpoints, which is important for, you know, in group discussions. That's one of the advantages of being a part of a group, being part of a team is that you get that 
diverse viewpoints, different ways of viewing things. And so you want to take advantage of that in participative leadership um, by, by, you know, getting that diversity of viewpoints and having them all be heard. Now, on the downside, downside, we've touched on a couple of these, but it's more time consuming. Decisions take longer to, to reach. Right? Um, the channels are less defined. The communication channels are less defined. It's a little more murky compared to like an authoritative chain of command. It's not as clear. Um, you have the weakest link effect, in, which means basically that you're, you're relying on uh, everybody in the group to participate. And if they don't, you're, you're only going to be as strong as your weakest link, in other words. And the, the idea that more transparency in group discussions and in those types of things means less informational security. So the more people that know something, the more likelihood or the more opportunity there is for that information to be less secure. Right? So when you have more transparency in a group, you have the, the possibility of less group security, less information security. So you had positives and negatives for participative leadership as well. Next, we can talk about delegative leadership as a style, which basically says, I'm trusting you with this. Um, leaders handing things off to other people. And, uh, and so you have the leader delegating the different tasks to that group and to those group members. So in delegative leadership, the leader hands out the assignments. The leader's still in charge, but they're handing out those assignments to others. This allows the leader to take advantage of experienced and competent team members. So when you have people who know what they're doing, you can just kind of hand something off to them and say, look, you know how to do this, so go do it. And you know how to do it well. You have a lot of experience or, or you know, expertise in this area. You go do it. And so it takes advantage of that in the team members, it takes advantage of that experience and that expertise. Uh, it can lead to work silos, though. People get protective over, you know, no, this was given to me. It's my project. I don't want anybody else involved in it. it can, and create a situation where one person doesn't know what the rest of the group is doing, where everybody's just kind of doing their own thing, and, and they've, they're in that silo, and they're not seeing the bigger picture. They're not seeing what everybody else is doing as well. So some positives and negatives to delegative leadership. Um, it does leverage, as we said, that experience, and that competence, that, ex that expertise. It takes advantage of that in, in a positive way. It encourages innovation and creativity again, in delegative leadership. And it, it can be individually satisfying. It can be very satisfying for individuals because they have the opportunity to really take something on as their own and to um, be in charge of that project. So, so it can be um, very satisfying for them individually. However, you can have difficulty with the system adapting to change when things change or things, you know, because people are kind of, they get territorial and that can lead to that difficulty in, in changing. They don't want to give up what they're doing. They're not familiar with what everybody else is doing. So when you have something that changes or is different, it can be difficult for a team to, to pivot and to, to, to evolve as needed. And prioritization may not be clear to the entire team. Everybody, you know, inherently thinks that their task is the most important and their part of the project is the most important. And so it may not be clear to them what takes priority, what's going to get the most resources and why their part of it may not be getting as many resources. So that prioritization may not be clear to the team because they don't have that full picture. Another type of style we can look at is called transactional leadership. And this is what we would call the carrot and the stick model, right? Where you have the carrot and the stick. So rewards versus kind of punishment, so to speak, right? So the transactional leadership, the leader has the ability to reward and or punish. Usually they have the ability to do both, right, to reward and punish, uh, but at least they have the ability to do one of those or the other. The leader sets goals and the team understands the consequences. So the leader is setting out the tasks, setting out the vision, setting out those goals. And the team understands that if they achieve those things, then it'll go well. And if they don't, then they're going to, you know, maybe be some consequences, some negative consequences to that. So they're setting the leader, setting those goals and then helping the team understand what the consequences are or the, or the you know, positive or negative consequences are for that. Uh, focus is on maintaining the status quo in this situation. Right? When you have transactional leadership, you're just trying to keep things going as they are trying to keep things moving forward in the same way that they have. So you're trying to maintain that status quo. Uh, so positives and, and negatives here, we can see uh, and the positives are that the goals are set and understood. Those are made clear to both the leader and the team. You get increased motivation and productivity maybe surrounding that because they understand they've driven toward those goals. You have a clear chain of command. The, again, the um, like authoritative leadership, you know who's in charge and who's responsible for what. And, and there's a clear chain of command there. And members can potentially choose the rewards. You can give them the opportunity to say, look, this is what you're working toward, right? This is why you want to succeed at this. And, and they can maybe have some say in what their reward is then. 
Uh, on the downside, you have minimal innovation and creativity. You're just trying to keep the same thing going. There's not a lot of opportunity for people to be innovative and creative. There's kind of a low degree of empathy between the leader and anybody else. It's either you did it or you didn't. And there's not much empathy usually within that system. And there's a limited development of leaders within the team then. So you're not really focusing on developing people as the leaders. You're focusing on getting them to do their job the best they can, but you're not really developing then internally those leaders to the next generation, so to speak. Uh, and next we have transformational leadership where, where we say where you have a leader that says, see this with me, see it with me. Right? In transformational leadership, the leader casts the vision. So they set out what you're moving toward. They cast that vision and then they encourage and empower the team and, and really tool the team, give the team the tools that they need to, to reach that vision and to help uh, accomplish achieving that vision. Then, right. The leader should serve as a role model. The leader has to be at, at the front of things, you know, leading the way. They can't just, you know, start shouting out orders. They've got to be the one, in, you know, getting their hands dirty with the team. Um, after they cast that vision, they're helping you know, row the boat, so to speak, to get you there. Positives and negatives to transformational leadership. You do have a high morale in transformational leadership. People really enjoy it. You have a low turnover because people who are there tend to want to be there, so they stay. And you get a lower amount of turnover in transformational leadership. It really values relationships and, and puts people as a priority. So the people involved in that and involved in that group are going to be a priority. It values those relationships. It places an emphasis on motivation and inspiration. And so the leader is focused on those things, motivation and inspiration, which is positive there. On the downside, there's a potential for deception by the leader. You see this in cults, for example. A lot of times our transformational leadership in cults, there's potential that they're just lying to you and misleading you. So there is that potential. Um, it does require regular motivation and feedback. So that can be time consuming for a leader. It requires them to be in there providing that regular motivation and feedback. It also depends on buy-in. It depends on the people, uh, the group members, to buy into what the leadership is selling, what the leader is selling there. So, um, so that can be an added challenge. So, as you've seen, you know, along the way with leadership, there are many ways to get to the same place. None of these leadership styles are inherently bad. Uh, it depends on you and your leadership style and what the team needs at the time and whether those match up well. So, uh, I encourage you to spend some time examining your own leadership style. Uh, and to, to really understand that, to see how it might fit best in different groups. But we can see that leadership comes from a variety of different places and shows itself in a variety of different places, can be employed and enacted in a variety of different, uh, different ways. But leadership takes on many different forms and many different styles. If you have questions about any of these different leadership styles, please don't hesitate to email me. I'd love to talk to you there and, uh, and chat more about this in that way. So uh, please send me an email and we can discuss that further. And in the meantime, I hope this gives you a better understanding of just some of the, the basic leadership styles and, and some insight into uh, what your own leadership style may be and how you might be able to use that most effectively.